Hello, the internet. I'm Dr. Peter Allen. I'm a bioanalytical chemist, and on the weekends I like to make videos about science and science fiction and occasionally cocktails. Today, my little project is not for drinking. I've been thinking about the two meanings of the word essential. Now, one definition means necessary for life. And the other means of the essence. Now, both of these have scientific roots, but only one of them has any real experimental basis. Now, essential amino acids, that's an example of the use of essential in a very different sense than essential oils. So let's talk about what we mean when we say essential amino acids. The human body uses about 20 different amino acids, 21 if you count some obscure ones like selenocysteine. Now of those, there are about nine in the body that we cannot synthesize from simpler building blocks. That means that those amino acids must come from food. For instance, human cells can synthesize alanine, but they cannot synthesize methionine. Now, if we do not have methionine in our diet, we will eventually become deficient and then sick, but we can make alanine from whatever we eat. Most people are going to get significant and sufficient quantities of the essential amino acids in any reasonably balanced diet. That's especially true if that diet includes significant amounts of meat or milk protein. So the only time that essential amino acid deficiencies are really a problem is when someone's eating almost entirely a single grain, like an all rice diet. Foods that have all of the essential amino acids are called complete protein. Now, the precision with which biochemists have mapped these processes and synthetic capabilities of the human body is amazing. Every reaction to create or convert these amino acids is known. Every gene that makes the enzymes that perform these reactions is known. This is essential in a very deep sense, and we know a lot about it. It's not fuzzy. Of course, not all humans are exactly the same. There are genetic variations among people, right? Some people may not be as able to make all the amino acids as others, and they may never know it because it's always going to be in their diet. There might be people who just make some less efficiently. But what this means is that any individual might like to have a special diet. Should people get a customized diet? Well, we don't really know. How can we measure what's good for each individual person? How can we map what genes relate to what is best in terms of diet for an individual's health? How will that compare to a diet that's just kind of good on average? These questions are the next frontier. These are personalized medicine. And to be clear, this is not about measuring the processes. We know those. This is about measuring individuals and how they differ. So that's all essential amino acids, extremely precisely mapped known science. What's different about essential oils? When people talk about essential oils, it might as well just be a different word. Essential oils contain the essence, or the stuff that smells like, their source material. This is an imprecise idea. You heat some plant matter, you collect the vapors, the molecules that came off the heated crap smell like the crap that came off of. Big surprise. Thus, the essence of Let's take an orange peel. You heat up the orange peel, you get the oils, the oils contain the smell, the essence of the orange peel. There's no specific biochemical or even chemical definition of the essential oil of an orange peel. It's a diverse collection of lots of different molecules. It's going to be different for any given tree from year to year and certainly different for any variety of orange. And critically, essential oil derived from oranges is not necessary, that is to say, not essential for human life. Nonetheless, there's a big market for essential oils as alternative medicine. Now, the reasons for this go deeper than an accident of language, but I think this accident has helped the marketing of these chemicals. And they are chemicals. They're as much a chemical as any random concoction of carbon molecules. And it bears mentioning that plenty of plant-derived chemicals are very toxic, like a digitalin. It's compound derived from the digitalis flower, also called foxglove, is quite toxic and can cause heart attacks. Essential oil of foxglove is certainly not essential for humans, but we could look at something more benign. Let's talk about the essential oil of spearmint. I went to Walmart and bought some. I was curious. According to the internet, you can dilute some essential oil of spearmint in some vegetable oil, and it diffuses into the room and it smells nice. Then maybe it helps you study. I have my doubts, but, you know, according to some papers, there, there might be some small effect. 
I went to the local thrift store, I got this little bile, I went home and cooked up this dilution of peppermint essential oil. And it is a lot like, it's a lot like chewing peppermint gum, even though you're not chewing anything. So there you go. The actual use case that works as advertised. Put some peppermint oil in the room, and the room smells like peppermint. But what's in it? Now, Snoozy et al. showed 63 different chemicals in spearmint oil. Here's just a few on the wall over here. You can get all of that in one little vial. The two that are the most abundant, the largest components, are limonene and cineol. Quick correction. I left out carvone as one of the major components, as well as all of the miscellaneous hydrocarbons. Why would someone want to buy limonene and cineol? Well, ideally because it smells nice, but I think the other drivers are probably more important for the marketing. First, an unmet need for real medicine. If you can't access real medicine because it's too expensive, then you might turn to this. Two, an unregulated market for plant-based stuff broadly labeled as supplements or aromatherapies. And three, a deep suspicion of authority. When you have an unmet need, unregulated market, and psychological hook like that, you have a potent mixture for driving sales, and essential oils fall nicely into that category. Cobble together a list of oils with the corresponding sciency marketing language like supports immune function and supporting healthy blah blah blah, and you have a DIY formulary. So is this a collection of garbage placebos and lies? How could we even tell? Well, experiments, of course. What we want is pretty simple. We want to see if these oils affect some condition more than a placebo. We don't want the measurement of that condition to be influenced by the subject or the experimenter. So both the person being measured and the person doing the measuring need to not know if they're getting the intervention or the placebo. That's called the double blind placebo controlled trial. But we can smell these oils. So we have to get a really clever placebo or else we know which group we're in, and so do the subjects or experimenters. Now, this paper by Kennedy et al. has a really good example of a clever placebo. They were using peppermint oil and handing out doses, orally administered, to be clear, that's generally unsafe for non-professionals, but they handed them out in paper envelopes, and they treated all the envelopes with a little bit of mint oil so that everyone smelled mint the same way, whether they got to eat mint oil capsules or vegetable oil capsules. They also did some cell experiments, but I have my reservations about those. The concentrations they were using were a thousand times higher than blood concentrations of most drugs. So I, I take that with a grain of salt. But what I found really interesting is that their clinical studies looked fairly convincing. Uh, some of those had statistical significance that was pretty low. If you're running 20 tests and you get a P of 05, you expect one to be a false positive. And indeed, they got several at P of 0.05, but they got one at P at less than 0.001. So that's actually pretty significant, even for a study of this size. So it's something. I don't want to hate on this paper. It has interesting findings, and they're pro I don't want to say they're just statistical noise. They might be. But we, I'm willing to accept that this could be a real effect. But even if these chemicals are not actually active in the human brain, they might still be useful. So psychologist Roche et al. improved memory with smell. They're not using psychoactive chemicals from these essential oils. They just allowed their subjects to smell roses while playing a memory game. And then they exposed their subjects to the same scent during specific cycles of sleep. The people who were exposed to the scents in sleep improve their recall. And it was dependent on when exactly during sleep they were exposed. So aromatherapy might not improve brain function directly, but I think it could be a useful cue for doing creative work. So if you're trying to build a habit and you always put out a specific smell when you build that habit, that smell can be a cue for getting into that specific work. So I'll try to get some work done in my minty fresh office and let y'all know if it makes any difference. You can check on that at peterallenlab.com and I'll, I'll put up any results as well as update here. Anyway, thanks for tuning in and I will see you all next week.